This is my new Patreon series number 17. Today we're going to discuss uh, whether or not Yeshua was married and what we know about the family of Yeshua. Now the family of Yeshua are known as the Despasinoi, those who were traveled with him who were his relatives. And the family lineage of Yeshua uh, that survived uh, through recordings into future generations by the church fathers and so on were known as the Despasinoi. Uh, those belonging to the Lord. There is absolutely no mention of a wife of Yeshua or a holy bloodline. The first surviving generation of the family of Jesus is shown in this little diagram on the right hand corner. We have at the top Joseph and Mary, the parents, and Joseph's brother Cleopas and his wife Mary, who were the uh, parents of S Simon and Simeon. And then Joseph and Mary were the parents of James, Joseph, Judas, Shimon, Simon, that is. Salome, Mary, Joseph, and Jude, or Joseph, may have been Joseph. Judas is known as Jude. And uh, the uh, other, the rest, the next generation we know about is Zochar and James, which came through the family of Jude, or Judas. The historical family that survived after Yeshua's execution were nearly all disciples and consisted of brothers, sisters, aunts, and uncles. As we will see, um, many of them were apostles, traveling uh, apostles who went to synagogues and other places. So the Despasinoi, or the relatives of Yeshua, were considered to be normal human beings like all other disciples, not royal lineage holders or a sacred bloodline. According to Eastern Hagiography, which is this, the stories and legends of the saints, and an early legend that's reported by Gregory of Tours in the 6th century, the widowed mother of Yeshua later left her home in Nazareth to travel with the apostles Miriam Magdala and John, son of Zebedee, to Asia Minor to escape the persecution of Jewish Christians by Herod Agrippa in AD 42, in which James, the brother of John, was beheaded. James and John were the sons of Zebedee, and uh, they were both uh, very active apostles and preachers and proclaimers of the Basor. Uh, Yeshua called them Boanerges, the sons of thunder, because of their brilliant oratorical skills. <coughs> now both the mother of Yeshua and Mary Magdalene died of old age within a year of each other in Ephesus. Now that was not within a year of coming, it was after they had been there many years and then they both died because why? They were both the same age. They were Mary Magdalene was the age of Yeshua's mother. Uh, that is supported also by archaeological evidence and uh, the structure of a sepulcher of Saint Mary, the mother of the Lord, and the celebration of her dormition or going to sleep or dying. And you can still go to that uh, holy place in uh, near Ephesus and uh, and and see the place of the dormition of the mother of Yeshua. <coughs> so the only lineage from Yeshua is that of the Apostles, what today is called the Apostolic Succession. And it probably began in Jerusalem with James, the brother of Yeshua, as reported by Eusebius. Here I've put up on the right hand of the screen the, the list of the 12 bishops of uh, Jerusalem, or the leaders of the, of the Jerusalem uh, Jewish Christians Messianic group starting with James and then Simeon and Justices Zacchaeus and Tobias and Benjamin and so on uh, and <clears throat> uh, uh, finally ending with the 15th Bishop of Jerusalem uh, Judas and the last Jewish sage to hold that office before the expulsion of all Jews from Jerusalem as a result of the Bar Kokhba revolt in AD 135. After that 
the Jerusalem lineage was merged with that of the Antiochene and uh, others and became a Gentile lineage, not a Jewish lineage. So the surviving records of apostolic succession uh, that uh, that are were kept in the Gentile churches begin with Peter in Rome or Antioch of Syria because they were maintained in Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches and that is the only lineage we have from Yeshua. The apostolic succession is uh, a lineage of successors of the apostles. Peter laid his hands upon a certain person and that person laid his hands upon another. They were later known as bishops and the, the succession of the bishops was a direct line that was taken down through history through 2,000 years and uh, it comes all the way into the 21st century. <clears throat> Other lines of succession like those of Thomas or John or Mary Magdala were either not recorded or possibly suppressed by the proto-orthodox and Byzantine Christians. Now we come to the topic of was Yeshua married? Many people like to think he was and they say that oh well it was customary for Jewish men at that time to get married in fact he just really had to and all that sort of thing so Yeshua must have been married uh, but many Jewish prophets were ascetic had no wives Elijah John the Baptist the Essenes uh, did not marry did not have wives some some of them didn't another brand of Essenes another kind of sect of Essenes uh, did have uh, wives and marriages but the sect that probably John the Baptist may have been raised by uh, took other children and raised them uh, without actually creating the children themselves and also James the brother of Jesus was <clears throat> was not married he was ascetic so that uh, that kind of life was not unusual for a prophet there were many married prophets like Amos and so on but Many of the greatest were not considered to have wives. Moses had a wife, but not many of the others. And there's nothing in the Christian or medieval Islamic Jesus traditions about a wife or children. You can't find that. Um, the 3rd to 5th century Gnostic writings refer to Mary Magdala as Yeshua's closest and most advanced disciple. The earliest claim that Yeshua was married to Mary Magdala was made in the 13th century by a Cistercian monk and chronicler named Peter of Vaudi Cernay, and he claimed that that doctrine that Yeshua was married to Mary Magdala uh, was part of the Cathari or Albigensian belief that Jesus had a relationship with Mary Magdala, who was described who was described as his concubine. So not again as his wife but as the person with whom he had <clears throat> uh, intimate relations. So it is only in the 20th century that the myth of the marriage of Jesus and Mary Magdala uh, is promoted. And the originator of this myth was a Frenchman named Pierre Plantard. He uh, during the war with Germany, so World War II, he was a collaborator with the Nazis. He was a French fascist, and he was the self-appointed head of an anti-Semitic, anti-Masonic anti group called Alpha Galates. And he forged documents to bolster his claim to be the rightful emperor of France because he was a descendant of Jesus. And he did that in order to defeat Charles de Gaulle for the presidency of France. He never got a chance to really run against him, but uh, Plantard's f uh, fantasies were to eventually be recognized as the rightful emperor of France by virtue of uh, a lineage that he traced back through the earliest kings of Gaul, which were the Merovingians. We'll talk about that in a minute. <coughs> And in 1975, Plantard had begun to associate himself with the St. Clair family, which was a family dynasty of Freemasons who had escaped uh, during the uh, 
during the, the murder of the Freemasons by the Pope and Philip the Fair, and uh, who had built Roslyn Chapel. And I have a, a whole uh, uh, seminar, three three hour seminar on uh, the, uh, the relationship of Freemasonry to what we find in uh, the Templar uh, church or uh, that was built or chapel that was built in the uh, early time before a couple of centuries before Freemasonry is considered to have begun <coughs> in the 17th century uh, and uh, it was built by these people and if you're interested you can take a look at that now this false name uh, uh, provided Plantard with a bloodline to prove he was descended from Jesus and Mary Magdalene using other documents he had forged. And the forgeries were later placed in the Bibliothèque Nationale as proof that a secret society had guarded the identity of a royal bloodline from Jesus and Mary, beginning with Mary Magdalene and Jesus, and continuing through the French Merovingian kings to the present Saint Clair family. That was the idea. So let's take a look at this uh, 20th century Jesus Mary Magdalene myth. Plantard posed as an expert on the Knights Templar, and when he was interviewed by the authors of Holy Blood and Holy Grail, who were not scholars, they were just journalists, they didn't really know how to discriminate uh, uh, actual historical documents from forged ones. So when he was interviewed by them for their book, he claimed to be a grand master of the Priory of Sion based on his forged documents and supposed records from private libraries of French nobility, which were called Les Dossiers Secrets, uh, and that were buried deep within the National Library in Paris, and he had actually snuck them into those documents and put in extra pages and wrote extra things. These are diaries and private records of the royal families of France that uh, that were then kept later in the National Library. So in their best-selling book called Holy Blood Holy Grail the authors put forward an hypothesis based on Plantard's information he had given them that the historical Jesus married Mary Magdalene, had one or more children, and that those children or their descendants emigrated to what is now southern France. And once there, they intermarried with the noble families that would eventually become the Merovingian dynasty, whose special claim to the throne of France is championed today by a secret society called the Priory of Sion. So that was the scam. But in fact, the Merovingians never, never claimed descent from Jesus or Jesus and Mary. They claimed descent from, quote, the gods. They, they were unlike other people. They grew their hair very, very long. They were considered to be uh, uh, unable to be defeated in battle because they had the gods on their side and so on. But Plantard sort of changed the idea of uh, their co their claim of having originated through divine intercourse with the gods to having originated from Mary and Jesus. <clears throat> so the authors, these journalists, were manipulated by Plantard to conclude that the legendary Holy Grail actually refers to the womb of Saint Mary Magdalene of the sacred royal bloodline to which she gave birth. In 1989, Plantard revised some of his forged documents, adding to the list of Grand Masters the name of Roger Patrice Pellat, a friend of French President Francois Mitterrand. And during the financial scandal involving Pellat, Plantard, who was called to testify, swore under oath that he had invented the Priory's entire history and existence, and so he wouldn't get any deeper trouble. And when the judge had his home searched, more false documents were discovered that purported to show Plantard as the true heir to the French throne. 
by this time Holy Blood Holy Grail was a bestseller all over the world and the idea was uh, going deeply into the sort of modern psyche of Jesus and Mary having been married and there being a holy bloodline. But in 1993, Plantar confessed to having created both the documents and the entire Priory of Cyan hoax. You ought to Google his name uh, and read Wikipedia articles or other articles about him. But the idea of a wife of Jesus resonated powerfully with <clears throat> those who were opposed to or could no longer psychically uh, let the one-dimensional Christian patriarchy, the the, uh, the the trinity of the three guys and all this sort of thing, uh, go unchallenged anymore. And a lot of the people that challenged us were women. And that was uh, went part and parcel with the women's lib uh, movement and many other kinds of things. <clears throat> Probably the first book that I think that was really seriously done about the whole issue, not about Jesus and Mary, but the whole issue of uh, how the relationship between men and women should be was written by Rianne Eisler, who actually lived down in Monterey, not far from me, and it was called The Chalice and the Blade, and it was a discussion of the pre-patriarchal societies that existed before the Mycenaean invasion of Crete and different other kinds of things. and. Uh, promoted the idea that we should have that kind of a partnership society, not a patriarchal society. But, of course, then, uh, Margaret Starbird came out with the woman in the, uh, with the alabaster jar, and a whole lot of other people sort of jumped on the bandwagon of the uh, Mary and Jesus uh, marriage, whether there was a bloodline or not, because they really need to have a deity that's not just male. They need to have one that's a, a partnership of male and female, like a Wiccan deity of the, uh, of the king and the queen, something like that. I can't argue with that, but unfortunately, they used false information to justify their position, and that's not good. So, for example, Margaret Starbird's woman with the alabaster jar claims that the... That the accounting of a repentant prostitute who washes the feet of Jesus with her tears in her hair was actually Mary Magdalene and that the woman who came in and anointed his feet before his burial who was named in one account as uh, Mary of Bethany <coughs> uh, as she claims is really Mary Magdalene So, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, it relied very heavily upon Plantard's phony evidence, served as the basis for much of Dan Brown's faulty information concerning the prior sign in the Da Vinci Code. <coughs> and this further popularized this idea that the big secret that's being hidden from everyone was that Jesus and Mary Magdalene actually worked together, etc., in as husband and wife. But there's no evidence that Yeshua had a wife or descendants by the time he conducted his prophetic mission. Well, what about the recently published Jesus Wife Fragment from Oxyrhynchus? Let's take a look at that. This is a Coptic fragment. Uh, these words are Coptic words. Uh, it's uh, it is something that was uh, that was brought forth very recently and covered by journalists and uh, all kinds of uncritical reporting uh, when it was introduced uh, by a woman scholar who did not claim that it was authentic but just started the process of it being examined. Uh, it's a fragment that seemed to be almost cut on one side, and it's it. It's like the middle of a page and all the other words are missing. So it says, not to me. My mother gave me life. And then there's a whole bunch of words missing. The disciple said to Jesus, a whole bunch of words missing. Deny. Mary is not worthy of it. A whole bunch of words missing. 
Uh, Jesus said to them, my wife. Ha, ah, my wife. Aha. Uh -huh. This fragment <laughs> was inquired, was acquired in 1997 by its current owner. It was uh, from a whole lot of small fragments that were never purchased by museums or anyone else and were still in the antiquities market from the Oxyrhynchus garbage dump in ancient Alexandria. <clears throat> ancient manuscripts did not last forever and they had to be constantly recopied. There were no Xerox machines and so on and papyrus could last a long time in a certain environment but in daily use it would eventually uh, uh, not no longer be a stable medium and so uh, lots of books were either uh, thrown into this this dump at Oxyrhynchus after they were no longer used or they were thrown in there by uh, by the uh, orth proto-orthodox Christians who were partisans of Athanasius and persecuted the uh, uh, the, the Greek philosophers and the Gnostics and the alchemists and other people and drove them out of Alexandria in the fourth century. <coughs> so this is a wonderful archaeological find and lots of things that have been gathered from it were already classified. Grenfell and Hunt did that in the last part of the 19th century and the early, by the early 20th century we had everything that was worth saving out of there they were just a bunch of tiny fragments that were not connected to anything else but that's what this collector had bought uh, so the fragment was acquired in 1997 by its current owner who wishes to remain anonymous and we'll discuss why that is later as part of a cache of papyri and other documents said to have been purchased said to have been purchased we have no evidence from a German American collector who is said in turn who have acquired it in the 1960s in then communist East Germany. So here's the word. My wife in Coptic. Jesus said to them, my wife, and then a whole lot of words are missing. She is able to be my disciple, a lot of words missing. Let people's, wicked people swell up, a lot of words missing. As for me, I am with her in order to a lot of words missing. Okay, so what is this? <clears throat> it's not part of any other fragments in that entire cache. So there's no gospel or other document that can be assembled where this fits into. It's kind of a one-off. But as scholars have been able to discover since it was first introduced, it's a creative mashup of Coptic lines taken from the Gospel of Thomas which we already have in its entirety. There are 20 logia <coughs> of the Gospel of Thomas in Greek preserved in the Oxyrhynchus uh, find. And of course the entire thing is preserved in Coptic uh, in the Young Codex which we have and have translated. But although either these are lines copied from the Gospel of Thomas, this whole f little phrase about the wife has been interpolated or written in. Now most scholars recognize this as a modern forgery painted onto a papyrus fragment that radiocarbon dates no earlier than AD 741 with easily replicated ink that was used between the period of AD 400 and 700 long after the period when the Gospel of Thomas and Gospel of Philip were being copied. They had already been hidden at uh, Nankamadi or thrown away in the Oxyrhynchus dump because of uh, proto-orthodox Christian persecution. Now there's a very close resemblance between Mike Grondon's interlinear translation of the Gospel of Thomas, which you can find online, and the text the, that the forger appeared to have used to compose the text of this so-called Gospel. Um, you can find every one of these lines in just looking almost exactly identical to this in the interlinear translation of the Gospel of Thomas uh, that Grondon put online just 
less than 10 years ago, or I was it 20 years ago. And Karen King, who first introduced the fragment, has now made available the interlinear translation provided to her by the owner of the papyrus, and it's easily shown that every line uh, has tremendous evidence of copying from Grondon's interlinear translation of the Gospel of Thomas. So given the extraordinary similarities between the two different texts uh, and the fact that the text that the uh, the fragment was just uh, made public less than 10 years ago, it seems highly probable that the wife fragment, as we call it, was forged after 1997 by the owner of the papyrus fragments when Grondon's interlinear was first posted online using a scrap of medieval papyrus from Oxyrhynchus. <clears throat> but this was not apparently from Oxyrhynchus because it radiocarbon dates back to about the 8th century. So it was not even a true Oxyrhynchus document. So the owner or forger did this to inflate the financial value for sale on the antiquities market. This is done very often by people to try to get museums and scholars to buy things that might be significant. And now you see why he wants to remain anonymous. <laughs> so the conclusion is there is no evidence for a wife of Jesus in anything or anything from antiquity or anywhere else. So I want to take you through a little vetting of the popular Mary Magdalene literature that's out there and it's basically it's, it's, it's uh, the uh, this popular literature which uh, either makes a lot of claims about Mary Magdalene or especially about the uh, Mary Magdalene and Jesus connection uh, is very popular it makes a lot of money on the pop markets but it's not backed by scholarship so how can you tell what's true and what's not true. Well, Catholic and other Christian literature for uh, a long, long time, since about the 6th century AD, incorrectly maintains the fiction that Mary Magdalene was a fallen woman or prostitute based on the way she's portrayed in the anti-Semitic and anti- uh, 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 what should I say, anti-feministic uh, report or account in, in the Gospel of Luke that says that Yeshua cast seven devils out of her and she was a prostitute and so on. Now that was interpretation that she was a fallen woman or prostitute. That was a fourth to fifth century spin by a certain bishop who made it in a sermon to his congregation and then it stuck and identifying the anonymous penitent prostitute who washed Jesus feet with her tears or with precious oils in that case be Mary of Bethany the woman with the alabaster jar is anonymous on one account she's Mary of Bethany and another identifying all these as Mary Magdalene out of whom Jesus had cast seven devils uh, the interesting thing about this, <coughs> out of whom Jesus had cast seven devils, that in the uh, uh, the Gospel of Mary, which is clearly the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which uh, survives from the second or third century, uh, and not complete, but there's a lot of it, uh, she tells about being taken up in a what appears to be a, a hermetic form of ascension, but is actually probably a Merkaba ascent by Yeshua through the guardians of each of the Shemayim of each of the heavenly uh, levels of each of the of the heavens and so on uh, and being taken up through seven the seven heavens uh, it may be that her claim to have been initiated into the Merkaba ascent at a much higher level and Peter, James, and John were initiated. They were just taken to the third heaven. Uh, that may have been already uh, subject to uh, scorn by the patriarchy that was taken over the church 
by the end of the first century when the Gospels of Matthew and Luke were written and later John. And uh, in any case, uh, this idea that, that she was possessed and Jesus had cast demons out of her is only appears in one source. It's a late source and it is a source that is definitely uh, pro-patriarchal, anti-matriarchal. The idea that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene has a great popular appeal and has been exploited by modern authors and media makers, but most of the information they supply is fictional. So avoid the following fictions if you want to discover the truth about Magdalenic tradition, because it was a Magdalenic tradition. The Da Vinci Code, the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and other books that claim to be based on Merovingian Grail legends from Europe. These were, of course, legends that were uh, messed with by Pierre Plantard. That is not historical evidence. Uh, as I said, the Merovingian bloodline fiction was created in the 5th century by the Merovingians to bolster their dynastic authority that no one could ever conquer them because they were uh, descendants of the gods. Uh, they did not claim descent from Jesus and Mary Magdalene, but simply from the gods. Avoid other literature that claims Mary Magdalene was married to or conceived a child with Jesus. It, there's no evidence at all for that. That's fiction. You can, if you want to uh, have a, a, a psychic sit down, sit down and tell you all about the life of Jesus, and you don't care, care about what really can be known historically, and you just like stories, well, then you'll like this sort of stuff. The earliest traditions, by the way, from the Orthodox churches in Asia Minor say that Mary, the mother of Yeshua, and Mary Magdalene died of old age, as I said, within a year of each other near Ephesus. So Mary Magdalene was probably the same age as Yeshua's mother and would not have been a wife even if uh, he'd had a wife. Now, authors like Margaret Starbird, The Woman of the Alabaster Jar, and uh, Jean Marcale, The Treasure of Ren, Les Chateaux type books, and so on. Books making claims about the Priory of Sion, uh, which is a fiction implanted into mid 20th century archives by French uh, Vichy Nazi occultist, and they used to mislead the authors of, of Holy Blood and Holy Ground, and so on. That stuff. Um, is you have to be very careful with. There was, in fact, a his, an historical priory of Zion. It was uh, established on the Temple Mount, uh, and, the, and the Templars uh, had partial possession of that. But it ended very soon after the Templars were exterminated by the Pope and Philip the Frere. It, it never continued as, a, as an order, but it was just uh, revived in fiction by uh, Plantard. So these people do not have the critical academic skills to differentiate fact from legend or fiction. Now I put a picture up here on the right hand of my dear friend Bishop Rosamond Miller of the Gnostic Center in Palo Alto who is hierophant of an ancient French Magdalenic order that dates from the 10th or 11th century in France. And she is the foremost contemporary proponent of Magdalenic Christianity. And she also debunks the idea that Jesus and Mary were married or produced children. It, instead of doing this, seek out books by scholars like Karen King, which I recommend. I'm putting one on the right side of the screen. It's called The Gospel of Mary of Magdala. Uh, and by a good scholar, Karen King. Anne Brock, Jacob Needleman, Margaret George, Marvin Meyer, people like that. Or my own seminar that you will find at Wisdom Seminars. That's where you can get real information and not fiction. So let's get back to looking at the surviving family of Yeshua, the Dispasinoi. According to Luke's Gospel, Cleopas, who was the brother of Yeshua's father, Joseph, and therefore his uncle, experienced one of the first resurrection appearances on the road to Emmaus. Uh, this is according to Luke chapter 24. Uh, so 
we can talk about the father of Jesus and his uncle. Now, the father of Jesus is obviously not still alive by the time of Yeshua's uh, ministry, his two or three years of uh, peripatetic uh, prophetic ministry, walking around the areas of Judea and Galilee and so on. But his uncle Cleopas is, and in fact Cleopas is a disciple. He's a follower. He's a hearer of Jesus, Yeshua. So Yeshua's younger brothers, other than James, were traveling missionaries. James stayed in Jerusalem and at the temple. He was a priest. And so his younger brothers, other than James, were traveling missionaries of the original Jewish churches, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.5. So we have Joseph or Joseph, Judas or Jude, and Simon or Shimon, and two sisters, Salome and Mary, uh, that were disciples and became apostles. And they, they traveled far and wide to synagogues uh, and, and, uh, uh, and proclaimed the Basor after Yeshua's crucifixion. And Hegesippus records that two grandsons of Yeshua's brother, Judas, uh, two grandsons, Zoker and James were brought before the Emperor Domitian. Here's Zoker and James in this, in this little uh, genealogy. Were brought before the Emperor Domitian. There's the Emperor Domitian who reigned from 81 to 96 AD uh, on suspicion of fomenting revolt to establish a Jewish earthly kingdom. You see, at this time, uh, the uh, siege of Jerusalem and the ensuing destruction of Jerusalem and the temple that had been uh, prophetically forecast by Yeshua and which uh, many of the Jerusalem Christians had left before the worst happened and so therefore escaped uh, but after that period between that and then the second big Jewish revolt in AD 135 the Bar Kokhba revolt which resulted in the renaming of Jerusalem to uh, Aeolia Capitolina, a Roman name turned into a total Roman city. The, the temple was totally destroyed, and Jews were not even allowed. They were banned from the area. But in that intermediate period, when uh, Zocher and James uh, were alive, and they were the grandsons of Jude, um, and Jude was had probably already deceased, but had been an active uh, evangelist in the early Messianic uh, Jewish church, churches and synagogues. At that time, uh, there was a very con great concern about Jews, because the Jews had been a religio licita, they were a licensed religion. The Jews were allowed to worship their own God in their own way, in their own cult in Jerusalem. But after this time, they were not allowed to do that. It became an illicit religion. And uh, just a small group, a kind of uh, seminary, was allowed to maintain itself in another city called uh, Javnia or Jamnia. But nobody was allowed to sacrifice animals or do the cult. And people were still wanting to foment revolution. There were a lot of revolutionaries around. And so the Emperor Domitian was uh, very is concerned about the uh, uh, these descendants of the of the the, uh, the Apostle Judas, Zoker and James, and they were arrested and brought before him on suspicion of fomenting re uh, revolt to establish a Jewish earthly kingdom, uh, which would have been of course the goal of the Messiah Ben David, the Davidic Messiah. And now I'm quoting to you from Hegesippus. They said that between the two of them, they, uh, Zoker and James, had only 9,000 denarii, half belonging to each of them. And this they asserted they had not in money, but only in 39 plethora of land, that is just property land so valued from which by their own labor they both paid the taxes and supported themselves. Now they were 
not tax resistors, which suggests that Yeshua's ruling on paying taxes was interpreted by at least some in his family as a sanction to pay taxes to the Romans and avoid conflict with them, which seems to be what Yeshua taught. And then Hedisippus goes on, to prove that they were hard-working peasant farmers, they showed their tough bodies and the hardened skin of their hands. They also explained that the sovereignty, or Melchuth of Christ, was not earthly. And uh, so Hegesippus implies not a political kingdom whose supporters would rebel against the Roman Empire. And based on that, convinced they were harmless and despising them as mere peasants, Domitian released them and ordered the persecution against Christians to cease. That is the report in Hegesippus. How really accurate it is historically, we don't know, but we do know that the surviving family of Yeshua, uh, Yeshua uh, was known pretty much into the uh, into the, the third generation of grandchildren. Now, probably the foremost expert on Yeshua's family is Richard Balkman, who's a professor of New Testament studies at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, and if you're interested, here's a, a site I put up, a link that you can copy uh, to read some others of his writings about this topic. I'm going to quote from him. He says, Careful readers of the New Testament know that one of Jesus' relatives, his brother James, played a prominent part in the early history of the church. Not so well known is the fact that other members of the family were also important figures and continued to exercise leadership in Palestinian Jewish Christianity down to at least the early second century. Very often in families when somebody becomes very famous, uh, that becomes the meal ticket for a whole lot of other people. But I don't think that Yeshua was being used as a meal ticket, you know, because he was famous like you find today with the children and grandchildren of celebrities in Hollywood and so on. Rather, I think that these were people who were disciples of disciples and were carrying on the teachings and the traditions, and they were, in fact, a dynastic uh, tradition within the family. The whole family was involved in. Uh, this kind of messianic spirituality and uh, were and it is transmitted through the families as well as through other people. Now while James assumed preeminent leadership at the center of the Christian movement, says Bachman, the other brothers of Jesus worked as traveling missionaries. Uh, here's a nice little meme I found. Jesus Townsman stated that Jesus had four younger brothers and some sisters. It's just in Mark 6.3. And Mark is the, by far the earliest gospel that's used as a source for Matthew and Luke because it's written a couple of generations before them and probably preserves a lot of the stories or pericopes uh, that are were historical that were told by Peter to his hearers. And Mark is supposedly a hearer and even a manuensis of uh, Peter. And Mark says, uh, that the people said, and the way he wrote this is, is this not the carpenter? And then it's the word it really is in carpenter. The word is, uh, would probably be a stonemason. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not these his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him, and so on. So, the earliest accounts tell of his family. Uh, Christians don't want to hear about this, uh, especially the Catholics, because they want Jesus to be the only one in the family, and he's, of course, his father's not Joseph, but God, and all this other kind of stuff. But So there's a lot of resistance to this information, and a lot of uh, rationalization to somehow uh, separate Jesus from his brothers and sisters. Oh, they were all children that... Uh, uh, Mary had before she married Joseph, or no, Jesus was the first one, uh, but uh, they adopted them, or they make up all kinds of reasons how he could have brothers and sisters and still be the only begotten Jesus. So he goes on to say, we know this from an incidental but revealing reference to them, the brothers and sisters, especially the brothers 
of Yeshua by Paul. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul maintains that although he has waived his right as an apostle to be supported by his converts at Corinth, he has this right just as much as the other apostles do. He could be supported. And that was, of course, the convention. Traveling missionaries, as you read in the Didache and so on, could stay so many nights and be supported and could even join a congregation and uh, be the, the main teacher of the congregation and be supported, that is, provided food and so on. And he goes on to say, it was an accepted principle in the early Christian movement that traveling missionaries had a right to food and hospitality from the Christian communities among whom they worked. Evidently, wives who accompanied their husbands on missionary travels also had this right. Paul attributes both the right to support and the right to be accompanied by a wife to, quote, the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, that is, Peter, in 1 Corinthians 9.5. In instancing among the apostles the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, Paul attends to associate himself with people whose claim to apostleship and its rights was unquestioned and unquestionable. So that's why he gives us this little glimpse into what was going on at the time. The Lord's brothers must have been so well known as traveling missionaries that they, along with Peter, were the obvious examples for Paul to choose even when speaking to the Christians in Corinth. So this gives us a little more insight into the, what they were doing. And, uh, and it also indicates that the uh, brothers of the Lord, uh, other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, Cephas, were all married as well. And he goes on to say, and since it's unlikely that James was well known for missionary travels, because he stayed in Jerusalem all the time and was finally murdered in Jerusalem by the Herodians. Paul must be thinking primarily of the other brothers, Joseph, Shimon, and Jude. And that's what he probably means. By the way, uh, uh, Saint Simon and Saint Jude are uh, reverenced as saints in the canon of the Catholic Church. Uh, I haven't found any images of St. Joseph, but uh, they have their own ways of understanding them in their own Catholic hagiographies and so on. But they were the brothers, and undoubtedly the physical brothers, of Yeshua. So let's look at one more thing we know about the family. The family was afraid that Yeshua would be arrested by the Herodians because uh, he was making himself a target. How do we know this? Well, in uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark and the Synoptics and Thomas, they all record a saying of Yeshua embedded in the same pericope or story about his mother and brothers standing outside of a house in Nazareth where he is teaching and calling for him. The story goes like this, and Mark, the earliest, most historical account of this incident, they have come to overpower and restrain him because they think he is insane. Then he, Yeshua, went home. That would be Nazareth. Uh, he had been in Capernaum and staying at uh, the house of the mother-in-law of Cephas of Peter and so on. And in Nazareth, the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when the family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for they were saying, he has gone insane. They've come to get him. Brothers have come to, to grab him and take him out of this environment. Now, piety for the mother and brothers of Yeshua has led many commentators to say that they who had come to uh, restrain him uh, because he had gone insane refers to other people. But the grammar makes it clear that in, the pericope, in this pericope, Yeshua's family were the they that came out to take him by force, cratane, by power by overpowering him, because they feared he had gone literally out of his mind, exeste. The, the Greek is very plain. Kai akusantes hoi par autu ex elphon kratesai auton elegangar hati 
exuste. He was out of his gourd. Now Mark's pericope is probably a historic remembrance of Peter who would have been there. Kephas. Out of his mind did not mean they thought he was possessed by an evil spirit. Rather, they knew that because he was preaching the Basor of John the Baptist, Yeshua exposed himself to accusations of sedition and legal trial by the Herodians. He was exposing not only himself, but possibly his family to political reprisals. He was therefore out of his mind to take these risks. And that's what out of his mind means. They were there to they, they try to talk him out, probably, of doing these missionary activities or proclaiming the Basso or whatever. And uh, now they were in their own town. They were very concerned because he was going to bring the heat down on everybody. Calling attention to oneself as an apocalyptic teacher of messianic prophecy in Nazareth, which was just a short distance from Sepphoris, uh, the, the city built by Herod and, and, and uh, populated by the, Her the, the loyal Herodians, uh, and Herodi royal Herodian Jews and Gentiles, or in nearby Galilean villages that were populated with many Herodian Gentiles and Jews as well, was very dangerous. Yeshua's family thought he was insane to publicly provoke the Herodians with messianic teaching and healing, and that is why they wanted to restrain him, not because they thought he was crazy. When told that his, quote, mother and brothers were standing outside calling for him, he replied, and this is the, the background for this famous saying, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around on those who sat about him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And that's the way it appears in the Gospel of Mark. Later, when it's uh, redacted and edited and, and spun in a little different way, in the Gospel of Matthew, that he omits the statement that Yeshua's family thought he was insane. That would be impious. So we don't want to have any implication that the mother of Jesus uh, thought that he was out of his mind for doing what he was doing. He was, they should have all been with him from the beginning was the idea. But so this, uh, this uh, way appears in Matthew is for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and mother. Um, Mark and Matthew have whoever, but Thomas has a probably more authentic uh, one that says, those standing here. Now, disciples stood while a master taught. Yeshua would have sat while these people, uh, while the disciples would have taught. Because Yeshua was not proclaiming the Basar, which would have been a different situation. He was teaching. He was teaching people. And it implies that the disciples were standing in the presence of the sitting teacher as was done for private instruction, other than at a Shabbat Seder. And the story from the beginning of Yeshua's public preaching reveals that his mother and brothers were not among his earliest disciples. His earliest disciples actually were employees of Cephas, Peter, at Capernaum, the fisherman. So what we find is that an initial rejection by the family slowly changes over to loyalty. And we have some sayings that help us to understand that. Yeshua says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his own relatives, and in his own home. We find that quoted in all of the Gospels. Uh, well, actually, Ma Mark, Luke, John, and Thomas, uh, and it's nobody doubts that it's an authentic saying of Yeshua. Uh, the most historical version is preserved in Mark, probably through again Peter, where Yeshua visits Nazareth with his disciples and is rejected. So he doesn't begin his mission in Nazareth as Luke's gospel would claim. He has him stand up in the synagogue and read from Isaiah and so on. Uh, but rather, he's visiting, he's come back, he's now gained some fame, and he's coming back now with his disciples 
uh, into uh, Nazareth. And this is probably at the time that his family was rejecting him as well, and were always not wanting him to be doing this kind of teaching and preaching. Uh, this story is later redacted and multiplies into elaborated accounts, many different kinds of accounts of rejection, and even stoning of Jesus by the synagogue at Nazareth at the beginning of his ministry, which probably uh, comes in through the Q document or documents. And you find this in Matthew and in Luke and in Thomas. Um, Luke, in Luke, they take him to throw him off a cliff. They're going to stone him and they're going to throw him off a cliff. And he passes through their midst and so on. And this, this rejection from Nazareth story evolves uh, up to the period of AD 85 to 100 into many different anti-Semitic Gentile Christian stories of multiple attempts by Jews to stone Jesus. You find several of them in the Gospel of John. Uh, that the Jews you know, were, were rejecting Jesus. The fact is, Jesus was extremely popular. He was like a rock star. Uh, all of the villages were, were in expectation of his arrival when he made his rounds and so on. So he was not unpopular at all. The Jews, it was with the Herodians. And the Herodians is a dynasty that goes through several generations from the original Herod down through Herod the Great and Herod the First, Herod the Second, Herod Agrippa, and so on. So when you hear the word Herod, it's not just one person, it's the Herod family. So when the rejection, what's called the rejection in Patris, it's the way it's usually described, that means the rejection in his own fatherland, in his own home. Uh, when you consider the rejection in Patris, alongside the early Markan representation of Jesus' mother and brother standing outside the home of Peter, seeking to restrain Yeshua, the earliest accounts indicate that Yeshua was initially not accepted as a prophet by either his home synagogue or his own family. But we also know that later his mother and brothers and sisters came to acknowledge him. His family descendants, the Dispasanoi, were honored in Paul's epistles as apostles who traveled to diaspora synagogues like Peter did. So the first uh, disciples that Yeshua made were not in Nazareth. They were in Capernaum. They were the employees of the fisherman uh, Kephas, Peter. Peter was called Kephas later by uh, Yeshua as an initiatic name. And it was later then that his family kind of came on board. So this saying also clarifies another thing. This authentic saying, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, clarifies the issue of Yeshua's self-consciousness. What was his self-consciousness? Was he the Messiah? Did he think he was the Christ? Did he think he was going to go uh, onto the cross and suffer for the sins of humanity as a sacrifice? No. He saw himself as a prophet. That's what he was doing. He was being a prophet. So while Mary Magdala is always represented as a loyal disciple of, of Jesus, Mary the mother of Jesus is not. She becomes the subject of her own cult later on, even though she doesn't preach, she's not an evangelist, she's uh, eventually a widow who's just being taken care of by other people. So at the time of his public ministry, his father Joseph had apparently died, but Joseph's brother Cleopas had uh, become disciples and his family had become disciples of Yeshua. So all of the brothers and sisters of Yeshua eventually became disciples, but the father Joseph disappears, probably died, uh, and mother Mary remained in the role of a mother, not a disciple or an apostle. So that is about what we know about the family of Yeshua and what can be known from what we have in documents that are critically examined. And the mother of Yeshua, as, you, as we say, eventually becomes uh, a separate cult as Jesus becomes identified with, with Godhead. And therefore, well, how can, he, how can he be born of a human? Well, it's the Hellenistic business of 
a male deity impregnating a female uh, woman who is very pure that we hear many different ways in other Hellenistic myths and so on. And it is that is uh, worked into the stories of Jesus by the you know the announcement of the angel Gabriel that she's going to become impregnated by the Holy Spirit and all these other things. Well, I'm going to remind you that for a $5 patronage, and you can do patronages for $1, $2, or $5, or $10. For a $5 patronage uh, per video presentation on Patreon, you will receive a PDF file of the pre-Christian teachings of Yeshua and all the other ones that are received by people who make $1 and $2 commitments. You can purchase the Kindle ebook file online for $9.99. The paperback version is available online at lulu.com for 20 bucks plus shipping. And from me at my Yeshua workshops for $18, where it's much less expensive. But this is uh, a very comprehensive book on what we know of the extant historical teachings of Yeshua uh, taken out of their early Christian redactional spin and put back into the Jewish context. So please click on the Patreon link in my description just below the video to become a patron helping to sponsor my new videos on the pre-Christian teachings of Yeshua. Thank you.